Well, Shabbat Shalom, Haksamea to all of our viewers online. Uh, welcome you to Congregation Mishkan David. Uh, we celebrate uh, the Festival of Trumpets, um, Yom Teruah, also called Rosh Hashanah uh, in our uh, Jewish tradition, and just invite you to join with us uh, today. And ask uh, and go to the Lord in prayer. Habuna de Boashmai, our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this time, Lord, this, this uh, celebration of the festival, Lord, that you have provided to us and to our people and to all those who have joined themselves to you through the covenant. Abba, we thank you for uh, continuing to grow in our minds and our hearts the meaning of this day and what it signifies, Father, what it means for our people as well as it, what it means for the future. Lord, we thank you. We ask that you would be again present here in this time and in this place. And we invite you, Ruch HaKadisha, Holy Spirit, to be present with us to make this festival truly beautiful because when the creator of the universe our God is here, that he makes all things beautiful. We thank you for this time, and we consecrate it to you. And we ask this in the name of our King, Yeshua Hamalek, our King and our God. Amen. Well, today we are uh, remembering and celebrating um, Yom Teruah, which is um, the, the more ancient name uh, of what this day is, uh, the uh, Feast of Trumpets. Uh, you, you will generally hear in... Um, and, and every day speak uh, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Rosh means uh, head, and Hashanah is uh, of the year. So it's a, a time in which it begins uh, a Jewish New Year. We eat apples and honey as a way of uh, remembering the sweetness of God, as well as um, we wish each other um, Shana Tova, which uh, is a, a good and sweet year. And that's a, a blessing that is used uh, during this time of the year. So um, if you have Jewish coworkers or, or friends and you wish them that, wish them that, uh, they will be uh, in one impressed that you knew anything about that, uh, and they'll probably ask you, how do you know that? Uh, but it's uh, a, just a customary blessing. If you have your scriptures, if you turn over to the, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 29, I always like to go and kind of show the, the significance of the feast. Um, how many uh, feasts of the Lord are there? Five, twelve? Seven. Seven, okay. And so we use the, um, the menorah as kind of a, a map, so to speak. So how many uh, feasts are there in the springtime? Four. Yep. And so there's three feasts that are still uh, unfulfilled. The, the first set of feasts was when Yeshua was here the, the very first time. Um, what was the fourth feast that everybody knows? called Pentecost, but we call it Shavuot, uh, the Feast of the Harvest. But that was the uh, time in which the, the Spirit um, was given. And so then we, we have three more feasts that will be fulfilled uh, in His second coming, which is, and the first is, is what we celebrate today. Uh, so we like to look at the ancient meaning or the ancient practices. So uh, Numbers 29 and verse 1, it says, in the seventh month and on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary work, for it is a day of the blowing of trumpets or shofars. And you shall offer a burnt offering as a sweet aroma to the Lord, one young bull, one ram, one seven, or, and seven lambs in their first year without blemish. Their grain offerings shall be fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an epa for the bull, and two-tenths for the ram, and one-tenth for each of the seven lambs. Also, one kid of the goats as a sin offering to make atonement for you, besides the burnt offering with its grain offering for the new moon, and the regular burnt offering with its grain offering, and their drink offerings according to the ordinance as a sweet aroma and offering made by fire to the Lord. And so these were uh, offerings or, or, um, that, were, uh, that were actually um, taken to the Mishkan before the temple was built, and then the, the temple afterwards. And this was offered up uh, for you know, each uh, each family. Well, we don't um, burn animals anymore. Uh, we don't present um, um, a, an animal sacrifice anymore. And, and why don't we do that? First reason was because we, we, we would say because Yeshua is, is, is our ultimate sacrifice. And two, there's, there's no temple. So no Jew can offer uh, the required sacrifices in the temple because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and we don't have to because he is the fulfillment of, of all the sacrifices. And, and what were all the sacrifices really pointing to? 
to Yeshua, and it, sacrifice was offered for reconciliation to God. Amen? And, and so Yeshua has sacrificed himself. He was the perfect um, lamb, bull, um, dove, and um, any other animal because he was sinless, perfect, spotless. So he has reconciled us to God. Um, we present ourselves as a what? Living sacrifice. So we, again, are in that process of, I mean, it is literally, is it, is it sacrifice that we did 20 years ago? Or is it a continual sacrifice that we offer? It's continual uh, until we breathe our last. We are a living sacrifice. We're not a dead sacrifice, and we're not a past sacrifice. It's an ongoing sacrifice. Amen? So this is the significance of, of, of the day um, in, in the sense that, we are, uh, that we're celebrating it. Well, we know that each of the seven feasts are of, they're really all about Yeshua. Uh, and so we, we see that this feast uh, that we remember is something very special. Uh, it is one of the, the feasts, and most of the fall feasts are what I like to call kind of a, a happy-sad time. It's happy for the righteous, and it's sad for, for those who, who have not or will not come into covenant with God. So happy, why? What is this day significant? Or what, what is it the significance of the day of, of, day of trumpets? What's that? It's a new year, even greater than that. Yeshua comes home. The scripture says, which we'll read later on, that the great angel blows a great shofar, a great trumpet, and that's the mark, the signal for him, for Yeshua to return. And it is a, 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 a joyous time for the righteous because if we are passed from this life, we'll be with him coming back. And if we are upon this earth when he returns, what happens to, to the righteous at that point? It says that, that, we, that, that, that he, he catches us up to the clouds. So it's, it's, it's a very joyous time. Why is it not so so joyous for the world. What happens in, in that time and just after his return? Yep, there's basically um, in this point, and I don't, I don't pretend to, to like know orders and this and that and the other things, but basically he returns um, and the nations of the world go up to battle against him. Um, and what happens at that battle? They're liquidated. They're, they're, they're completely wiped out. But it is really, again, God's judgment on, on mankind that it's done. It's, it's, it's it, it, basically the human race ha has had its opportunity to, to try it. And you know what? We, we keep messing it up, don't we, as human beings? So, but the next uh, day is, is 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, which is what? Yom Kippur. Um, it's a very serious and a sober time uh, for our Jewish people in particular. Uh, this feast marks the 10 days of repentance or the 10 days of awe. Uh, and Yom Kippur is a time in which, according to Jewish tradition, not necessarily according to the scriptures, that the uh, righteous are sealed in the book of life for another year and the wicked are written in the book of death. Uh, and it's kind, of, it's kind of game over at that point. So in this time, um, a, 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 a pious and um, one who has practiced traditional Judaism will, will be in repentance and will be going to anybody that, that they may have hurt or they may have, have caused harm and asked for, for their forgiveness, which is a good thing. Um, and that's a, a very um, valuable practice. And I would encourage us to be doing the same thing um, every day. But this time of, of, of the feast or the, the, of the year is a, is a special time to be able to do that. So I would, again, put it upon um, each of us that if we call to mind someone that we have hurt or that has, uh, we have caused harm to, that we consider using this time as a way to ask for their, their forgiveness. So we, we celebrate today, uh, the, which is ultimately called uh, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it's also called, uh, from the scriptures, uh, the Day of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. Um, if you were to ask your average Jewish person did you celebrate Yom Teruah? They'd probably go, what? Because Rosh Hashanah is, is the customary term that is uh, in use among our people. So they wouldn't probably know what you meant. But if you said shofar, 
they'd know what that was. Uh, the shofar is uh, a ram's horn. Um, a, a later, um, as, as our people um, got to different parts of the world, they began to use uh, shofars like this. This is, comes from Africa. Uh, it's a horn of a kudu. Now, can you imagine uh, having two of these on your head? Uh, <laughs> My, one of my, I think, I think it was one of my kids was like, we, we, should, we should be like the Longhorns. And I was like, it's a good Texas joke, but we're not going to go there. So the, but it, it is a horn that is uh, naturally hollow. Uh, it has a bunch of, of stuff inside of it uh, after it's removed from the animal. You have to clean it out really, really well. Uh, otherwise, um, we, we say it gets a little bit John the Baptist-y uh, in its organicness that's in there. So you have to clean it out. Um, but isn't that beautiful? A beautiful image of, of, in order to be used, it has to be cleaned out. In order to be used, we have to be cleaned out too, amen? And then the breath of God can go through us and, and it can be a useful tool for the kingdom. Again, so many spiritual analogies that come from physical examples. Uh, it's customary to wear white uh, during, uh, especially the uh, feasts of the Lord. Uh, white is, is a symbol of, of a purity, and so the... Uh, Congregation is decorated uh, with with much less color. Uh, it is it is pretty much mostly white um, as as a form of that. If you remember in the book of the Revelation, it says that the saints had done what to their robes? They, they'd washed them. Did it say God washed their robes? It says they actively participated and washed their robes. And, and the robe um, is a symbol of righteousness. When it also says in, in that uh, portion, I believe that says that, they had, that their robes were without spot or wrinkle. Um, and he, he's speaking of, of linen. Have you ever worn linen? You'll notice I don't. Because it wrinkles. Uh, and it gets, but it, but it's, it's a very breathable fabric. And, and all the priest garments uh, in, in the Torah were made out of linen. So without spot, which is hard enough, um, I have a spot somewhere on here that I purposely leave to remind myself that I'm not there yet. And so spots represent sins or blemishes. And wrinkles, again, is another example of that. If you know linen, you'll know that it's impossible to keep it without. So a spot is something that we can do, that we are actively participating in, in this lifestyle of repentance. Because we can see the spot. That, that's really easy, so to speak. But the wrinkle, and that's on God. He, he has to remove that from us because we cannot. Because linen of itself is wrinkly, like a newborn baby, so to speak. We've already read the portion from Numbers uh, 29 about kind of, of, the, of the significance and the sacrifices. If you would turn over to Genesis chapter 22. Uh, Genesis chapter 22. The very first song that, that was sung um, was taken from this uh, portion, uh, and it's called the, the Akita Yitzhak, the Binding of Isaac. Um, that, he, that Isaac, we know the story, and we're not going to read it per se, but as much as refer to it, that um, Isaac went willingly up to the mountain with his father. He at, it, 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 it appears that he didn't know that he was going to be the sacrifice, but Abraham did. And so, um, but Isaac, when he found out what was happening, he willingly let Abraham bind his, his, his hands and his feet. And, and he then uh, Abraham put him upon the altar to be sacrificed. So the wood sacrifice that was, it was carried up, because remember, uh, they, 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 they brought a couple of things. They brought what? Up, up to the mountain. Does anybody know? Wood? wood? Fire. And fire? Knife. What's that? Knife. Knife. A knife. Yes, knife. And so all of those things are very symbolic. Um, well, we, we uh, fast forward to uh, several thousand years to, to Yeshua, and we find wood was the cross that he was, he was sacrificed upon, um, and it was his obedience was the fire. And so we see that in the binding of, of Isaac was a, a foretelling, a picture of the sacrifice of Messiah. What did God do for Abraham in that moment? Because he was about ready to slay Isaac, Isaac. What's that? Yeah, he provided what kind of sacrifice? What's that? 
Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a goat or, or a ram. And this is where we get the ram's horn, the shofar that we blow, um, as a sign or a symbol of that sacrifice that God provided. Um, he, he provided, it's like the, they, the, the angel said, stop, Abraham, do not slay your son, your only son. Um, Isaac is called the son of promise. Um, did Abraham have any other sons? And Ishmael, who, who was actually older than Isaac. Um, and God has a plan for Ishmael. But Isaac is called the son of promise. And so it is this son, again, which was a, a foretelling, a picture uh, that the prophet um, Isaac would be like the others, a, a, a sliver of what Messiah himself would do later on. So this is what we see, and again, if you're taking notes, it's in Genesis 22, and it's most of that chapter. So we see that a lot of the symbolic things that we do are, are not so much so we can like, look great, um, it's to point us to something greater. Because you can wear white all you want, and if you have um, evil within your heart, um, it doesn't matter what you wear. So we, we do physical things um, to hopefully spur us on towards spiritual growth. Um, so what's an example of a spiritual growth? Can anybody think of one offhand? Humility. Humility? Patience. Patience. What else? Love. Love. Faith. And faith. And peace. And peace. Um, ladies who were at the uh, women's gathering, what was, what was our topic? No pressure. <laughs> what? The, the, the topic um, on, on, our, on our women's Bible study. The remembrance of God. Uh, to remember him. Uh, because when we remember God, it, it's hard to do harder to do the other stuff. When you have God upon your lips and in your heart, as, as I've said before, it's not impossible to praise him singing beautiful praise songs and call somebody an idiot driving in front of you. It's, it's possible because I, I live it. But it's harder to because we should be focusing upon it's coming from here and here. To worship God, to, to praise him, um, it calls us to something greater, something bigger than, than you and I. Well, this day, as we, we've seen, there were sacrifices that were offered, um, animal sacrifices, uh, that were pointing to uh, the great sacrifice. Um, it was a... When, when, when God gave the, the Torah to, or, to our people... Um, on Mount Sinai, what did they have to do before he, he spoke it to them? There was, there was a couple of things they did three days before. They had to wash, the, they had to wash themselves, they, like, like physically. What else did they do? Okay, they, they, they abstained from relations between husbands and wives. They washed their garments, too. Um, if you see that, you, you, you'll be able to see the spiritual significance that before they received the words from God, they had to purify themselves. Um... Okay, so they washed their bodies and they washed their, their clothes and they got up there and there's God and what happened? They got scared. They had purified themselves on the, on the outside, but inside they were still broken. And so it was, it was too much to hear from God. So they had to have somebody who could hear God and then tell them what God had said. And, and who was that man? Moshe, the, the prophet Moses. And so he, again, as all the prophets do, represented Yeshua, who was able to bring us the words of God in, in a way that we could understand. And Yeshua came in the flesh um, as a prophet. Didn't, didn't, didn't Moses say that a prophet's going to come after me who's, who's greater than I am? Um, all the prophets, any of them that were worth their salt, would say, yeah, I may speak the words of God now, but there's one coming after me that's greater than me. And we see that the forerunner himself, um, Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, said, yeah, you know, this is great and all, uh, everybody getting wet out here and all, but there's somebody who's coming after me who's greater than I am. In fact, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and, and take off his sandals. He pointed past himself. I'm sure it could have been very uh, um, you know, egotistical to him to go, oh, man, I had these like six guys that were hanging out with me as my disciples, and, and now there's like 30. And he could have gone, yeah, this, this is pretty good. But he said, no, I'm, I'm just a voice. Um, I'm not really even important. He said, I'm going to point you to somebody who is important, 
and who is worth following. And so everything throughout the scriptures is pointing to a single person. And that person would be God himself, Emmanuel incarnate in the flesh. And so if, if, if it sounds like that we're talking about Jesus a lot, it is about him. Um, if it sounds like we're, that we're glorifying Yeshua um, in, in, in our Judaism that we practice here, if, if, if it sounds like it's all about him, it's because it is all about him. Because he is worthy, amen? So that's what, what we focus upon. And this day is, is, a, is, a, is a time in which we, we celebrate and we're going to do something afterwards, which I know you'll enjoy doing, because I enjoy doing it too, and it's eating together. Uh, but, and, and, and we celebrate him even in, in, our, in our, our feasting. The early uh, followers of Messiah, uh, they would get together and they would have an agape feast, a love feast, which meant, man, they love being together. And you know why they love being together? Because his love was flowing through them. And they, and they loved each other because they saw God in the eyes of a brother or a sister. And that's awesome. So it's, it's really, again, all about him. He, he's coming back. And there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen before he comes back. But he's coming back. And our people have been crying out for Mashiach, our Jewish people, for thousands of years. And we as, as Christians, as believers, have been calling out and crying out for the, the return of Messiah. And he said soon, and his definition of soon is obviously a little bit different than ours, but he's coming back soon. And if it were to be today, would you and I be ready? If we were to walk out of this building and not make it another step, are you ready to meet him? And so in, and we say that this feast is a happy, sad time. It should be for you and for me to have a soberness about us as well. Uh, it's not about just getting up, uh, praising God, and everything is, is good and, and, and copacetic. It's about where is your heart and where is my heart in relation to him. And if we think that we're good, it's a pretty big uh, red flag going we're not. Because uh, we need to get rid of, of, the, of, the, of the red flag and start waving the what? The white flag, which is surrender. God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Because a humble man or woman is somebody who is upon their knees, figuratively. Don't worry about it if you can't do it physically. It's okay. A humble person is close to the ground. Because a person that's close to the ground in, in humility can, can't fall very far, can they? But those that walk uprightly in, in the not positive sense, when you're standing or you're up on a high place, you fall off, it hurts a lot more, doesn't it? So he says, walk humbly before me and be just. And justice is, is defined by God's laws. Sanity is defined by how close we are to God and how much we, we, that we are like him. Insanity is something that's far away from God, right? And this world is farther away from God. And so we are on this journey towards him so that we, our thoughts, become like him. Can, can, can we do that? Is, is, that just, is that too much? I mean, are we just stuck like this? Or is there hope? Is there, is there hope for you and me? Yes? No? Yeah. Here's hoping. That's right. No, it's, it's about belief that he said, in me you can do all things. And so you and I look in the mirror sometimes, figuratively, maybe, maybe actually, and go, ugh. Words tumble out of our mouths, and we go, where did that come from? Oh, God of mercy. We, we see the yawning thing within us that's where it comes from, those hurt places. We get so angry sometimes, and we go, where is that coming from? God of mercy, I'm a sinner. We have to draw closer to him so that we can be True representatives. And true representatives don't mean being fake to people because they can see our hypocrisy <laughs> easier than we can admit it. He says, no, be real. Be humble so that people can see the fact that, you know what, you're, you're broken like they are. And that should inspire people, hopefully, who, to want to hope in, in, in him because God is, the, is truly the answer to all things. So if you turn over to 1 Thessalonians... 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle uh, writes in, in various points and letters to, uh, to those that, that, that would read his words uh, about particular events that were coming in, in, the, in, in the future. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. Because um, there was a lot of a variance of, of belief. People, you know, people were just learning about this faith. They, they thought it was all this Jewish faith, but then they began to go, wait a minute, I, I, can, I, I can follow this God? I, I, I can do that? Well, they had to be told and instructed in, in both in what was in the scriptures, but also what had come after Messiah. So the apostle says in chapter 4 and verse 13, Do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. Do you know somebody who, 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 who has lost somebody recently? I mean, we're all human, and whenever somebody we love dies, it's, there, there, is a, there, there is a hurt and a loss there. But it, it should be a progressively healing thing to know that we will see them again if they are believers. It, there, we should have a hope that's different. Um, it isn't a, I think so. It's I know so because the scriptures say that upon passing from this life that we will enter into the presence of God. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. He says, if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, and even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Messiah. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet or the shofar of God, and the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with him, uh, shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort another with these words. So what, what, is, what does he say happens when, when Messiah returns? Okay, so there is a, a shout, and that's what teruah um, is. It, it's, it's a shout, it, it's, it's a cry. And it says that the, the great shofar, the great trumpet, will be blown. It's a sign to the world that the king is coming. Um, it will be received in various uh, ways. It will be so loud that it will be heard all over the entire world at the exact same time. It will be, wow. Assuming we still have a media at that time, there will be a lot of confusion and going, what is that sound? It will be so amazing, but the, the, the Messiah himself is descending, so to speak, from where he is into this place, this earth. And it, it's so powerful. The shofar is, is something to, that should wake us up. Um, it is a, a, a sign that something's about to happen. Um, we're going to be um, doing uh, the, the blowing of the shofar in just a second. Um, if you can, uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be loud because it's, it's designed to wake us up spiritually. But he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know what's going to happen, that when he comes back, the dead come alive. And it will be a, a, a magnificent time. Uh, 1 Corinthians, a couple chapters back. 1 Corinthians 15. And verse 51. He says, Behold, I shall tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet or shofar. Anytime that you see uh, trumpet, it's generally referring to, to, a, to a shofar. Shofar will sound, and the dead in, in, uh, will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that when this corruptible has put on incorruption and the mortal has put on immortality, then it shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Messiah and Lord, Yeshua. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable always, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He's saying that there's, at that point, um, it will be the, the, the culmination um, of the defeat of death. I mean, it, it has been defeated because life itself has spoken into Hades, Messiah himself, and, and, and it is, there is no more death for those who believe. And so he is saying, I'm life. I'm life. And he's, he's crying out through the Spirit of God in these days. And will be crying out till, till, he, he, is, he, the, till he, is, he is told to stop and it is done. Come unto me, he calls out. He calls out in streets and he calls out in homes and he calls out in, in places. He calls out through weak voices like you and me. He, he's calling to you and me. He said, you know me, but I want you to know me more and even closer. Don't take me for granted, says the Lord. But press into me so that, I, that you can know me in a deeper way. And wake up and stay awake. And that, is, again, is what this day is about. It is an awakening that there's something about, else about to happen. Because after he returns... Beautiful things happen, but then there's also the judgment which comes that is inevitable because he's, been, he's promised it. But he's saying, come unto me now. Come unto me. And that's the message of the gospel, is come unto God. Re return to me. He's saying that to you and to me. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Messiah himself is saying these words to, to you and to me. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. He's describing what, what will happen. He says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, and the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all of the tribes on the earth will mourn, for they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet or shofar. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the earth. Um, again, the blowing of the shofar. Um, tradition says that it will be the angel Gabriel who blows a great shofar. Um, he's the messenger. Um, he's the one who, who, who generally precedes uh, Messiah. Um, and he's going to, again, the angel blows the shofar. Um, and it, it is so loud that it, it, it is heard all over the earth at the exact same time. And so he, he tells us you know, that these things will occur. Um, he's not coming to judge because he enjoys judgment. He's coming because God will have said, enough. Enough. Enough suffering. Enough tears. Enough manipulation. Enough degrading of humanity and, and my creation. It's done. And I'm going to start over with those that have come unto me. And, and for the broken people that are still alive at the time, he says, I'm going to start over with you. And I'm going to show you my ways so that we can start this whole thing over again. Because God is a God who recycles. He doesn't throw away. He recycles so that he can recreate something. And that is of the beauty of our God is, is, is he is he, he's a God of second chances and sometimes third chances and maybe 57 chances. But we should take him now and not test our God. Amen. Finally, the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. He says, Now I saw heaven open. This is, of course, the, the Apostle John uh, relating what he saw. I saw the heavens open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True. Who is this? This is Yeshua. This is Messiah. Um, is he going to be riding a horse? I don't know. It, it says right here that he's riding a horse. I mean, if, if, if Elijah got taken up in a fiery chariot, which... I'm guessing he had horses on it, because that's how chariots roll. I, I, I'm guessing he's going to be on a horse. But however he comes, he, he is described here in glory. 
he says that he is called faithful and true. And these are our attributes of our God. He's faithful and he's true. He follows through with what he says. And he is faithful to you and to me and to all who, who call upon him, weak as we are. He says, in righteousness, he judges and makes war. When Messiah came the first time, what did he say? Please. He said, say please. He said, I didn't come to judge. I came to cry out. I came to be the sacrifice. So he came as Yeshua ben Joseph. Yeshua, the, the son of Joseph. When he returns, he's coming back as Yeshua ben Elohim. Yeshua ben David. He's coming back as the king. He came as a suffering servant. He's returning as the triumphant king. He makes war. Again, not because he loves war, but because there is no other way to fix this place. It says his eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written that no one knows except himself. Um, crowns, many crowns. He is... He has been given and, will be, and has been given all the titles of the kings of this earth. Um, he says he's crowned with many crowns. is because God has given him the authority over all the kingdoms. And he has a name that, that nobody knows. Uh, do you know that you and I get a new name? Remember that? What does it, what does it say that um, we're given a what, what, what kind of stone? So, a white stone. It's written your new name. Um, if you don't like your name, he's going to give you a new one. If you like your name, you're going to get a new one. <laughs> it's it's going to be, I just, knowing um, the attributes of, of the Semitic languages, um, our names will be a picture of us. And it's how God sees us. Um, you remember uh, the movie a long time ago uh, called Dances with Wolves? Um, you see, Native American language is, is like that. It's, it's a picture language, and I can't even begin to speak it in Iroquois. But these Native Americans looked out there, and they saw uh, Kevin Costner's character playing with a wolf. I mean, who does that? Well, and so he was playing with, with, with this wolf uh, who had become his, his friend, and so they named him Dances with Wolves. Um, our names that he, that he will give us are a picture of how he sees us. My beloved child, um, my glorious and, 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 and valiant one. Um, he's going to give you and me a name that how he sees us. Um, and, and believe me, he sees you and I better than we see ourselves. We rightfully so see ourselves as small. But he's going to tell us at that time, this is how I see you. Well, Messiah has a name that nobody knows right now. Not even the angels, not the saints, but only himself. It says in verse 14, um, oh, sorry, um, verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Uh, so he's wearing a robe, and I don't know if it means that it was, it was dipped in robe, or the entire robe itself is, is that wine-colored robe. Uh, dipped in blood. Whose blood? His own because he shed his blood for the sacrifice so that he could redeem you and I. It says, The armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, linen white and clean, followed him on, ho on white horses. So if you can imagine this great army behind him, he's, he's riding at the head of this whole, uh, whole army, and, and, the, and, the, and the angels and the saints are, are, are trailing behind him, uh, riding upon Again, he describes them as horses. Who knows what they look like? But it says that they're wearing linen, fine and clean, because it is of, of, of a heavenly cloth which can't be spoiled anymore. It can't be stained because there's no sin in heaven. It, it can't be marred in any way and wrinkled because they've been perfected by him. And so they, they accompany him in this. It says in verse 15 that out of the mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he shall strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, for he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. 
He, he speaks. Just like he spoke him, everything into creation, he speaks. And a sword, it is a symbol of that which slays. And again, it's, I don't know what he will say. I don't know what language he will speak. But if he does, it is my heart's belief that he says enough. Enough. I have wept down through the ages, especially since I came and I lived and I felt the suffering of what it means to be human. Enough. And he says that he will slay the enemies and it will be done. But it says that on his robe and on his, uh, on his thighs and the ring, King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, someone else in the past took this title, King of kings and Lord of lords. Anybody remember? It was an earthly king who was brave enough. I think there were probably several of them along the way. Pharaohs and Alexander the Great and Persian princes and kings, they, they called themselves the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But there's only one, and can only be one. Amen? Amen? The one who is given kingship by God, the Creator, and has been given lordship. And so we see that he's coming and he has been given um, great authority. And that's of what this day is a symbol of, is, is a sign that, that he is coming, that the King is coming. Let us go out and meet him, as it says in the gospel. Are we ready to meet him? Ah, I'm not ready yet. But I want, I want to, and, and I, I want to desire that so that I change my heart to be ready for him. Because chances are, chances, you and I will die and pass from this life before he returns. And that's even more uncertain than when he does return. But let's make ourselves ready. Let's... Take and, and value every breath, every, every day, as an opportunity to draw closer to God, to practice the remembrance of God so that he can correct our path. Amen. He says we can do this, and I believe him. Abba, we thank you for this time. We consecrate it to you. We pray that you would inhabit this time in this place, Father, that you would, as we blow the shofar, that you would wake us up. Father, the sound that comes today would, would, uh, would, would continue uh, to awaken us. Father, don't let us go back to sleep through the dullness and the mindlessness of this world. But let us be awakened alive spiritually that we seek you with our whole hearts, minds, bodies, and souls and everything that is with us. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 We have the um, Alvinu Malkenu, which uh, means our Father, our King. Um, and I'll, we will go ahead and, um, and I will say the Avinu Malkeinu and then we will all together say uh, the words after that. Alvinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, hear our voice. Alvinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we have sinned against you. Alvinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, have compassion on us and our children. Alvinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, May we be ascribed eternally in the book of life. Alvinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, fill our hands with blessing so we may bless others. Alvinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, be gracious and answer us. Be our rock and our salvation. Amen. We come to the blowing of the shofar, and this is to kind of describe the, the three sounds that we will be hearing. The tekiah uh, is one long sound. The shevarim is the three broken sounds, and the teruah is the uh, short staccato sounds, generally about nine. There's a, a fourth, which is called the uh, tequila gadola, which is a long blast of the shofar. Uh, I, since Rabbi Dan is not here today, uh, I find myself with the uh, task of blowing the shofar, so pray for me. Uh, I'll blow it till either I stop or I pass out. Uh, that is the, the, the long sound, which again represents the coming of the king, which we just read. Um, Mike is going to uh, help lead us in this. So when we get to this, uh, just after this, we'll come back to that in a second. When we get to this, oops, 
We're going to start with in the upper left hand corner to Kia and then go to Cheverine, to Rua, and then we'll start back over on the left to Kia, to Rua, to Kia. So you, you all will, because I'll be having the shofar on my mouth, you'll, you'll cry out, to Kia together. I'll blast, and then you'll all say, Cheverine, and hope that I'm still ready to blast and so on and so forth. So we start at the upper left-hand corner and go across and across all the way till we get down to the Tequia Godola. Amen? Amen. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Halom Asher Kiddushanu B'Mashiach Yeshua V'Tzivanu Lishmoa Koho Shafar. Amen. Together? Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in Yeshua the Messiah and instructed us to sound the shofar. Amen. All right, let me get started, or set here. If you need me, I'll be on the floor. <laughs> uh, Rabbi Den does it.